Haruki Murakami just released his new book, Novelist as a Vocation. And today I'm going to be doing a book review and a book breakdown about all the main points and the stuff that I thought was really good. I'm also going to be dropping a ton of Haruki Murakami content soon because Murakami is really one out of three people who I really want to focus this channel on over the next year. Year, The other two being Carl Jung and Cormac McCarthy. So if you guys, of course, are interested in that, subscribe to the channel and let's get going. So, of course, a lot of the big news publications and people, you know, some of the bigger reviewers, reviewers on Goodreads did not like this book. They called it vanilla. They called Murakami cranky. And I got none of this as I was reading. I was kind of shocked, but I shouldn't be shocked because if you guys go and look at this video right over here right now or over here, the publishing industry over the last seven years, academia, pub the publishing culture world, world has been going after Murakami because he is a sort of reclusive, apolitical figure who writes what he wants to write. He doesn't care what people think, and he's probably never going to change how he writes about topics that they maybe don't like. So we are here today to talk about the good things though. And so the first chapter of the text is titled, Are Novelists Broad-Minded? And this is where a lot of the complaints from people came from because of how he approaches no um, novel writing in general. And there's an actual trend with all my favorite writers and all the people who I think that are the best writers in the world right now. And they all have very similar lifestyle habits, writing habits, and thoughts about how they present themselves to the world. And it's a pretty reclusive lifestyle that does not bode well with the new image of the artist that is trying to be pushed. And Mirakami says that writers never really are friends with other writers because all writers deep down are kind of egotistic that you have to, you know, to be as, as we're going to talk about, to become a novelist, you have to sit in a room for hours a day and you have to, at some level, be a huge believer in yourself. You have to have an almost narcissist, a narcissistic belief in yourself if you're going to do this, especially for decades. And that's one of the main points that Mirakami also hammers down about this book, that he's not talking and giving advice in this book to novelists who are just doing it for a book or two. He's giving advice to people who are looking to do this for decades, do this for the rest of their life. And one of the main points um, in this chapter is that everyone has a couple novels in them. Basically anyone, even if they have a little bit of talent and almost no literary skills, they could write a decent novel, if not a pretty good first or second novel. But there are, but probably most first time novelists, you know, most people who release a novel never write another one. And as we get into five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten novels, the number is over 90% of people never write that number of novels, you know, after they've released the first one. And then there's a whole other group of people who think that they are writers and never release a novel in their entire life. And Mirakami actually just mentioned a fun and a uh, fun story about how when Proust and Joyce, uh, Marcel Proust and James Joyce, James Joyce were at a dinner one time, everyone was, you know, watching them, expecting them to interact, but they just kind of said, what's up? How are you? And they didn't interact because, you know, this idea that writers don't really get along with other writers. And Cormac McCarthy is a great example of that. Cormac McCarthy is literally not friends with any writers. He specifically works on all of his novel novels at the Santa Fe Institute, which is one of the top, you know, places in the country for scientists and mathematicians. And he says he can't stand writers. He wants to be around smart people talking about big ideas because that elevates him as a person. And I know, if, I'm sure if you guys have ever been a part of a creative writing program or a workshop, being around other writers isn't that great. There's always a clash of styles. There's always one-upmanship. It's very hard to find a very genuine writer who you can speak with and you every, and you can communicate with. It's better, as Mirakami states later, maybe to have friends who are just really good readers and can read your draft and discuss drafts with you, with you who are smart. But because what does being friends with the writer actually do for you? Like in the chat right now, you know, leave a comment. What does being friends with writers do for you? Because the best writing is done. It's all done on your own. You have to grow on your, your own. You have to learn sentence structure and find your inner voice and do all the hard work on your own. And a lot of the secret tips and tricks can be found out on your own through writing or just through reading a couple books and a couple, you know. So, you know, I guess unless you can find a sp specific person who's maybe in your genre, who's very detached and maybe a teacher and who's really willing to help, most of the time being friends with other writers isn't maybe the best thing. And that this is, of course, Miyakami's view. I don't know how much I believe this, but I think there's a lot of merit in it, though. And I know a lot a lot of writers who are friends with other writers, and all of them collectively almost get nothing done together or don't improve like they should be. But Miyakami also says that writers are actually very open to people coming into fiction. Like, people, there are a ton of first-time novelists all the, all the time. Like, Miyakami, for instance, never thought about being a novelist. Then at the age of 29, he's at a baseball game and says, I want to write a novel. And novelists and writers are actually pretty accepting. If I have someone come up to me and tell me, hey, Ian, you know, I'm writing a novel right now. I'd be like, great, good for you. That's awesome. You know, send it to me when you're done. Let me check it out. But there are people in other professions like, you know, in dance or art or, you know, even like the science fields or other th music. And if someone said like, if right now I said on this channel, like, you know, I'm going to make albums based off, you know, French horn albums based off of Haruki Murakami. A lot of people, because, you know, I can play brass instruments. A lot of you guys would be like, what? That's kind of cringe. Like, why would you, you No, know, maybe, maybe not everyone, but you guys get what I mean. That there's novel that Murakami 
says that novelists have a very accepting mindset for first time writers. And I would agree. So one of the other major points of this chapter, one that actually blew my mind, maybe more so than anything in this book is that to be a novelist, you actually can't be very smart because smart people can't be novelists over the course of their life. You can get, and Mirakami puts a timeline on it. You can use your intellect for around 10 years as a novelist, and then you can't use it anymore. And smart people, can't write a novel because right now, for instance, I have a novel that I'm working on. I could tell you guys in five minutes, five to 10 minutes at most, what the entire plot of the novel is and some of the major scenes. You guys could get it. You guys could know exactly what I'm talking about and probably the main message of the story. Well, it's taken me months and it's going to be probably another year before I even think about sending it out or releasing it of work. It takes time to actualize no um, novels. Uh, Mirakami works on novels for years. I made a video. Um, I just am releasing a video, I think today or yesterday. Yes I haven't released it yet, about how Cormac McCarthy worked on his latest novel for over 40 years. So it's a very slow process to actualize you know, something into a very well-written novel that people are going to enjoy. And, you know, there are a lot of other people who are smart enough and they could get a lot faster satisfaction by being a critic, by, you know, getting into something else that, you know, just gives you an inst instant recognition or instant results. And that actually hit me, at, you know, in the heart for this channel too, because like I'm trying to balance, I've never been the smartest literary critic or philosophy bro or whatever in the room. Maybe I am with like, you know, just like normal people or whatever. But like when I was at university and the undergrad and grad school, you know, people, there was always people who were just way more knowledgeable than me. And, you know, the school system creates a hierarchy, obviously with grades, but also um, in the in, and people trying to get PhDs, there's very few jobs for like English professors and philosophy professors. It's hard to get a job, so it's very competitive. So, you know, with this channel, I've actually am releasing a lot of trauma surrounding that and starting to not care because like I get com comments all the time. Like the other day, someone told me, you you are absolutely wrong about this. You must have been dropped. You're an idiot. You must have been dropped from the cradle repeatedly. You know, that's how, and I was just making a comment on a book, perspective about a book. And so there are very negative people and very toxic people when it comes to books and perspectives. And it's like that in academia too. So people like myself, for instance, think that I just need to get smarter, that I need to, if I understand more and I get, you know, more intelligent, then I will be more successful. But it's like, no, I actually don't function like that very well. I actually like to move a lot slower, be integrated with nature and have less distractions and kind of put around and make, you know, divergent think. And I think a lot of novelists do. I think that's actually the, a fine example of a novelist because most of the time, most, all the critics, all of Mirakami's critics, you know, the main ones on Reddit or writing for the New York Times, Mirakami says are smarter than him, that they know and are smarter than he is. And when they're analyzing his novel, they're bringing this instant energy, you know, to the novel because it's already been written. But to be to actually put that together, it has to be slow. And we're going to be going, that's a big concept that we're going to be going over today and throughout this video. Because, you know, and writing, you know, to every, this is all like compounding because writing is actually pretty uncool. You know, if you actually look at becoming a su successful novelist, it's a lot of time alone spent in a room, messing around with words, deep working. If you do it for a couple decades, you'll find success, but you're not going to find some like insane amount of success. You know, Cormac McCarthy for 30 years was winning literary awards, but had maybe sold 20,000 copies of his books, books that have now sold millions of copies, but it wasn't until one of his books sold 200,000 copies in a couple months that he finally blew up. Now he's considered one of the greatest authors in the world and all of his older works were masterpieces, but no one was able, you know, there just wasn't enough people reading them to really push them out into the public enough. And so another contrast is that novelists are like, it's very endurance oriented. If you're going to put together works, you know, whether any type of writing, if you're writing something that's very long form, especially like, especially a story, it's a process that takes years and has a ton of different elements to it. But if you're smart, you want to live a more leisurely lifestyle. You know, a lot of smart people aren't even involved in the arts at all. Most smart people know, you know, get jobs and are able to make a lot lot of money and you know buy a nice house and live a nice leisurely lifestyle they go to work every day and they maybe work out and they like to hang out with their family they live a very leisure oriented lifestyle but as a novelist you have to sit down and do the work every single day for decades before that before you can get good it's an endurance sport and a smart per why would a smart person decide to do an endurance sport when they could just sit and not have to work as hard and get you know actually way better results and live probably a much happier life and so Mirakami says that you just have to sink or swim that you have to try this so you have to try and that's basically basically what it is that if you try and you don't start, you know, you don't keep writing novels after a couple couple years, then it, you're just, it's just not for you. And this is very sad because now with MFA programs and art endowment programs,
programs and you know the university system there are so many writers out there that should not be writers but they're making money acting like they are writers they finish that one or two they finish one or two books and then they become an associate professor and they basically get to sit around and not do anything i a lot of my creative writing professors had maybe written one or written one or two novels in their life if zero i had professors that had written zero novels and they had a phd in it you know in creative writing and on average if like i go look at professors you know cv they don't release novels very often because they actually aren't working on novels they only release novels you know maybe once a decade or every little while to keep their status up because being ha being a novelist as a vocation which this book is about is hard it's going to require you to do certain things and take certain risks that we're going to talk about later so now we're going to move on to some other chapters and a, a comment i thought was interesting was that mirakami said that only five percent of the population actually reads books anymore but he also says that it's weird because we can't really improve that number because unless you start early unless you become kind of a lover of books early most of the time you you won't become a lover of books later i know a lot of people out there i've known people who weren't into books but got into books later but most of the time if your parents aren't reading to you you and you're not a big reader in middle school and high school you're not going to be become, become a big reader later and that was all i got from i think the second chapter chapter but there was a chapter on originality and mirakami says that you need three things to be an original author um you and you especially need two if you only have one you're not going to make it you're not going to be be a good novelist and the first one is that you have a unique style that people recognize on site that you're if you know that someone could you know maybe after a couple novels you could give them a blank novel with you know your novel in it without a name and they could recognize it was you immediately and i totally could if you gave me a book by mirakami that hasn't been released yet or a draft after reading it i'd be like that's haruki mirakami you know that's this person. And so as a novelist, you need a unique style, but that is recognizable. Sometimes, you know, if a style is too out there, then it won't be necessarily recognizable because people, you know, it's just too complicated. And second is that it needs to have the power to update itself. Over the course of a career though, that style always needs to be updating. And that ties into point number three, that that style becomes embedded with the audience. So if you think of Miyakami, you know, there's magical realism and cats and, you know, um, male protagonists who are always, you know, going on these spiritual, spiritual journeys and are aided, you know, by, female protagonists or female secondary characters and there's a whole Miracami culture that's kind of been created that we all feel but his novels are actually not that complicated you know you know maybe iq84 and a couple other ones are but Miracami actually has some pretty basic writing that has a lot of depth and imagination but a whole culture has been created from that type of writing which is absolutely awesome and you know there's writers for instance like Ernest Hemingway who you know started off but he couldn't update himself because eventually um you know because he had won a lot of trauma from um, being dressed up as a girl for the eight years of his life uh, unwillingly and then being trauma being wounded in World War One, he wasn't able uh, able to be a part of World War One. It caused a lot of trauma for Hemingway. So he, you know, projected hypo hy hypo hyper masculinity with big game hunting and fishing and all this and you know all this other stuff but then when he couldn't do it anymore as he got older suddenly he's, his writing started to decline a lot of his later works weren't as good and then eventually that led to a suicide you know i have a video on the channel called Heming hemingway misogynist or traumatized artist if you want to hear me go into hemingway he's a scholar he's a figure i've focused a lot of my scholar scholarly work on so we have these three things you need to have a unique style that people recognize at first sight you need to be able to update that style and and that style eventually has to resonate enough with the audience so that it can start creating a culture and it becomes a co-creative experience. And for a while, you can miss one of those things, but eventually you need all three if you're going to become a novelist as a vocation. I guess now is a good time to mention what novel writing has turned into because there are obviously a lot of problems with the publishing industry now. There is the meritocracy, meritocracy in the publishing industry was kind of never there, but now it's really not there because obviously these companies have quotas and marketing plans and they're just trying to stay afloat and they're not looking for the best writers. Obviously, if you are a really, really, really good writer and you put something out there, someone's going to publish it. But it's a lot harder now for first time authors who aren't, you know, in the categories that they want to get published. So, you know, then there's, so we have the publishing industry that's, you know, cracking and then there's the Kindle graveyard. Now, in the Kindle graveyard is a very sad place because people, if you want to be successful on Kindle, you have to do either two things. You have to either have a big audience, you have to have a big audience and just, you know, bring them over to your book, whether whatever type of audience, whether that's an email list, your celebrity, social media, whatever. Whatever. or you need to write to market and there's books out there and it's like the big part of the kindle world is you need to figure out like yo there's like bigfoot bigfoot erotica books are like out you know there's a big there's a big audience out there but there's only a couple books so i can write a trilogy right now get some good covers make an email list give the first chapter a couple sex scene chapters away and then boom we're going to going to make a bunch of money and that's the system that people are just exploiting the system and 
the readers who are reading these books don't really care about the quality and the quality can be pretty low. For instance, one of the main guys who wrote a book, I think his name is Chris Fox. There's a book called Right to Market and Fox makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and he can write and finish a novel in less than a month. He can act, he's finished a trilogy, I think in 60 or 90 days and, and like to publishing, like all the way through. And those books have made, you know, made him at that time, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars in a year. But it wasn't from his audience, you know, that he already had. It was from random people in whatever genre that he had exploited. So, you know, we're at this weird place and that is very terrible for writers though, because a lot of, you know, the great minds, you know, like Don DeLittle says, the great minds, you know, the hardest thing and most artistic thing that you can do is write a novel. If you're really good, it's like a very huge accomplishment. But now there's less and less room and people are telling you, why don't you just write, you know, sex books or fantasy books or sci-fi books and do that and it's like to, and to make that work it's not like you can do one great sci-fi novel and self-publish it might sell a little bit but then you have to you know they people want follow-ups and people want more you know writing a book that takes a couple years isn't the solution so at the end of this video we'll talk about some solutions that i found that i think that novelists should be doing that i think the most successful thing that you in su successful path maybe unless you're you know for novelists to take because you might not be able to make it for a couple decades now we might have not have the privilege that mirakami had so so back to Mirakami. Mirakami says that to be a great writer, you have to swim against the current, that you have to push yourself out there. That Mirakami did not, he broke all the norms with Hear Wind Sing in terms of Japanese literature. He said he hadn't even read that much Japanese literature. And if you look at Japanese literature at the time, you know, we have people like Mishima and other people kind of lurking in the shadows still. And like um, he talks about in the book how men's and women, men's and women authors were separated in bookstores and still are, which is absolutely crazy. And so he comes out here with this kind of magical realist book you know and then the next you know the next one pinball then a wild cheap chase are all very eccentric and eclectic and a lot of people were ragging on him and talking crap to him but he went his own way he charted his own path and if you want to be successful if you actually want to create that audience you can't follow and do what other people do unless you're just you know once again trying to do that kindle publishing method or slide into a little slot of the publishing industry that you know will work like right now right now a big thing is like diverse care like first person coming of age stories with diverse characters if you want to make money right now and get a publishing deal that's probably the high other than like young adult that's one of the most successful things that you can do right now to get published my old creative writing teacher just got a six-figure book deal with that method he didn't mean to do that that's the book he was writing but his book sold very fast and he got a lot of money for it so then we're going to get finally into some more of the technicals about sitting down and writing and the first thing is that you that Mirakami says and this mirrors everyone this mirrors all the best authors all the authors we talk about on this channel is that you have to lose ambition that being ambitious as an author is the worst thing that you can do as you know, and, and Mirakami asks is that you, you shouldn't ask yourself, what are you trying to get at, out of life and out of being a novelist? You should be asking, who would I be and what would my life be if I wasn't seeking anything? But as a writer, I didn't need anything because neediness creates this tension and blocks a lot of the creative flow. And Mirakami has never had writer's block before because he doesn't exist in this land of ambition where he needs to seek. You know, when you are seeking like that, it's a very easy way to blind the natural force from flowing with, you know, from flowing out of you as an author. Because Mirakami says you need to start with an idea about how you want to write, the, the way you want to write. And we all kind of have that. You, we should have all thought about that. Like, I want to write pretty intense books with very wild, outlandish characters, but that that also have kind of a grounding in nature and kind of a grounding in a, a spiritual point of view. You know, contrasting sentence structure and very rhythmic, a very rhythmic flow. Okay, well, it's I can say that, but once again, like a novel, you know, I could force myself there. I could, you know, study the best settings and copy the best people and imitate. And that's those are good methods. But I need to get there naturally, though. By forcing it, then my writing is going to be forced. And if I continue to write, my unconscious will leave me there. Leave me there. If I give my unconscious a problem, if I tell myself, if I say that's what I want, you know, take me there. I'm gonna do the quantity. You take care of the quality. You get me that quality, and I will pump words out of myself and practice for a decade. That's a lot better method than saying I'm gonna try to figure this in three years. I'm going to try and figure out how to write like this. Mirakami says that plotting out styles, even plotting out books are uh, bad. He says, you know, Mirakami is against plotting out a novel. Mirakami does not plot his novels out. He flows with it. He flo And we're going to get into this a little later, but same with his style. His style is organic. And that is something that we are missing once again, because of ambition, because that the dying publishing industry. And then of course the Kindle graveyard, people do not develop their own styles anymore. And I, I see this all the time in literature. And you could tell because a lot of people don't have their own styles and their editors have to get give them a style. They're a lot of editors now are just kind of creating styles and this nice broad stroke across the novel, but you can tell when the editor is doing way too much. And so you should never worry about the editors. You should never even worry about the audience. And because the more you worry, the more expectation you put on yourself, the larger the writer's block is. And writer's block is a real thing and it's all up to ambition, expectation, and
and all these things because it should feel fun. It should feel light. Writing maybe isn't easy. It's a very actually hard demand on the mind, the soul, and the body, but it should feel fun and airy as you're doing it. And and as you're getting drained, as Mirakami talks about. So next Mir in, in the next chapter, Mirakami talks about what, what do you write about? You know, here we are, you're a novelist. You want to do this for your career. What do you want to write about? And he says, the first thing you need to do is just read a lot of novels. And this is supported by everyone. Everyone is, a lot of the greatest novelists are very well-read. They're not the most well-read. They're not the most critical. They don't look into it, but they just kind of get it. You kind of like, if for instance, if you watch a lot of movies, you can understand how movies work in general. And that's what you were trying to do as you're reading. You're just trying to see what works, what doesn't work, what sucks. And all that is just going to go into your subconscious. So then as you're writing, you're going to lead yourself in the directions that you, that you know felt good before, all those positive anchors. Next, Mirakami advocates for starting to observe events in the real world with more detail, you know, having a phenomenological experience with life, you know, creating more awareness. And the only way you can do that is stop acting like things are right or wrong. You know, I was out at dinner tonight and I was out at kind of this weird restaurant. There's a bunch of weird people and I caught myself just making assumptions and judging. But Mirakami would say, you know, no, don't do that. You know, actually, because that's ruining the experience. You're tainting the experience. Be there and see the experience because there are people there and stories and characters and ideas for your subconscious that you can capture. And he says that you should start capturing those scenes and moments. For instance, I kind of saw this weird smelly looking guy walk up to this couple and it seemed like he knew the woman and he walked up to the woman and was giving her a hug and like, oh my gosh. And, they were, and these younger people. And after a second, you know, after a, like maybe 20, 30 seconds, then he acknowledges the boyfriend or the guy she was there with. And it was kind of awkward. And he was kind of only talking to her. And then kind of like, it kind of implied like, hey, we should hang out sometime. And then kind of left. And it was kind of weird. And the people doing it were kind of a weird crowd. And I could write about that. And I could remember that. And Mirakami said, you should write that down. Maybe, you know, that's not the best example. But that's the only thing that really happened to me today. So may, and so I should maybe write that experience down and put it into a folder, you know, in a drawer, you know, with all my ideas and observations of the world, I should start stockpiling all this type of information. Because if I ever have a character who's maybe in a weird relationship crisis or something, I can send that guy in that I saw tonight to cause a little bit of havoc. Or I can start stockpiling that that's what people like this do and people in this region and this area and who act like this, this is what happened. But you shouldn't use those direct experiences. You And this is where we see what Mirakami does. He says that you should take that, right? And then you should make it a little bit illogical. You should start a mystery with it. You know, maybe I, I, the character sees, you know, the the his girlfriend or whoever walks to the bathroom and the confrontation happens. And then when she comes back, she's like, oh, that's nothing. You know, it was nothing. Yeah, I know him. You know, I know him from here. And then maybe the protagonist sees him again somewhere weird, you know, and synchronicities start to happen. There's a mystery that's surrounding it, and that creates contrast and flow and development. So you shouldn't, as Mirakami says, says, you know, a little bit later, and I guess we can get into it now, you shouldn't use characters and people from your real life. You shouldn't use events. People love to do this. They love to just find people in their life. A lot of amateur writers love this. They just find people that they know. They find, they think about events in their life and they just write about it. And that's maybe okay, but you have to, your imagination is much stronger than your life events though. And if you get all these events and scenes and you write them down and then you let your subconscious and uncon your, your unconscious process it all and then you have them and you can look at them and pull them and then you add a little bit of mystery intrigue and non-linear linearity to them then suddenly we have a novel suddenly the imagination is running wild because especially like the first draft and creating characters for the first time it's a very imaginative experience you can in revising you can be logical you can make it all make sense you can be logic logical but for probably you know the first draft and a rewrite or two it's about the imagination it's about being creative and as we'll talk about Mirakami does five to ten rewrites per book so you have lots of time to be logical and make things make sense but it you can't really really function in both at once. You can't be creative and logical at the same time. So it's either one or the other. So you need to be doing the right one at the right time. But once again, ambition gets in the way and makes you want to be logical all the time and way too much because you think that it's the right thing and that's what you need to do because it doesn't make sense right now. I should fix this now. And it's like, no, let's see where this goes. Let's let this grow organically. And so when we have all these, I, these illogical and mysterious ideas, you should not explain them from a place of literary cliche and conventional logic. And that's what we see here. That's what makes magical realism. There's all these kind of odd things happening in the novel. And does Mirakami's characters ever question it? A lot of his characters, there's all this odd stuff and they just act like almost nothing's going on. Maybe they question it a little bit, but they're not having an existential crisis. 
Like if 5% of what happens to some of Miyakami's characters happens to happen to me, I would literally just lay down and have a breakdown. Like you probably would too. You'd be like, what is going on? Like this isn't reality, but books aren't reality either. They are the imagination and great novels take you to another world where you know the exact limits and constraints of this reality aren't there. Even if you don't delve into magical realism, th this is still true. You need to leave room for the reader to dream and to come up with this story in their own head. That's what makes writing different is that people, we get to visualize the story in, in our head as we're reading. And you know what's really sad is that I have students, I'm a high school English teacher, they don't do that as they read because I don't think they read enough. I tell them like, yeah, as, as I read, I imagine the story and they're like, I don't do that, what? Why would you do that? And it's like, what, what are you just reading, are you just reading words? Like how you, like that's how you follow the story like you think like okay they're in france in a coffee shop in 1432 like what does that look like so we need to stop suppressing the imagination mere comedy believes that's where school suppressed the imagination parents a lot of our societal structures suppress the imagination because if you, a lot of characters we're going to get we're going to kind of jump a couple chapters and we'll come back we're going to talk about the cap the chapter where he talks about creating characters and mere comedy said that he had you know he doesn't create he creates characters from his imagination and that it's he calls them the automatic dwarves that he 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 thought that like when in an automatic car there were like little dwarves doing the stick shift in there and that's what he believes with the characters as you start to write that the characters will come from your unconscious and that comes from the stockpile that comes from having a non-judgment judgmental attitude about it all and once again logic kills the story and the logical or the automatic dwarves in your head the connections and the synapses can't happen and the only way to create a, a dense automatic dwarf unconscious for characters is you have to get out there and you have to meet people mirakami worked at a jazz club i mean how many people do you meet you know running a jazz club for five or six years and going out there and you don't have to be social but you you know you need to be out there and actually observing people and actually listening and being aware and when you are social in the world you also have negative experiences and it's funny that Mirakami says, and I'm sure we, you and I would agree, because I do, that a lot of the time we actually remember a lot of negative experiences with people, and that's what we think about most. Like when I think about, you know, past experiences with people, like there's a lot, there's some, there's a lot of negative experiences in there I still think of them like, what the hell? But that's where the villains come in. That's where a lot of the ideas happen. And if you don't have any negative characters in your life, then it's going to be hard to have your unconscious pull out these negative characters because that's what Mirakami talked about is that for a while that he didn't, you know, he didn't have those characters really in his unconscious. So he tried to force it. He tried to force these villainous or, you know, whatever type of characters. He kind of saw that in like a hard boiled under. Um, a hard-boiled wonderland and the end of the world. You know, it wasn't as the, the 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 villainous characters weren't as strong, for instance, as Kafka on the shore, where we, we, we have a guy literally killing cats. You know, and some of the evil characters, and like in the wind a wind up bird chronicle. You know, the skin the skin slicer guy. Mirakami says that he accessed that negative. He had to tap into that. That he had to draw that out. And once, if you look at basically everything, you know, Wild Sheep Chase and a lot of those books, it wasn't that Norwegian Wood. That person wasn't present inside. Those characters weren't there. Another thing that Mirakami believes is that great novels have great secondary characters and he mentions actually a novel that I absolutely adore Demons by Dostoevsky and that there's so many insane secondary characters in that novel you know the main one that is that is a crazy I can't remember his name right now he's a crazy psychopath and a lot of novels if you look at even like going back to the Canterbury Tales like you having these characters and having these odd inclusions make stories better David Lynch you know the filmmaker does that really well in my opinion there's like sometimes just random kids like oh my god like who are these people Monty Python you know the, that's that's kind of one of the gimmicks. And we can do that as novelists too. We can add some of these insane secondary characters in. And you know, one of the great things about characters and novels is that you can write anyone. You can be anyone who you want to be. You know, you can write about characters from all different walks of life. And that's, you know, people are trying to shut that down now and say that, you know, you have to write characters in the way that we want to you to write about them or you're creating violence against people in the world. And it's like, you know, pushing a harmful narrative. And you know, that's obviously a bunch of bullshit. So, you know, as a novelist, never fall into that. If you want to write a character, you should write that character. And as long as, you know, obviously it's not career end stuff you know that you're saying some crazy stuff you should write characters as you think they should be written and trust your imagination and not care what the backlash is i actually know a novelist and she is an indigenous author she's a member of a tribe in the united states and she wrote a book i think it was, it was it's a science fiction book about a female protagonist in a tribe that wasn't her tribe and this character has a bizarre relationship with that tribe's religion and spirituality. Well, that tribe and the academics in that tribe and the community at large didn't like that, said that she was, you know, imposing and writing about this in a way that she wasn't supposed to write about it, even though none of it was negative. And she got ca canceled, you know? She lost um, part-time university teaching position, a fellowship, 
publishing deals, speaking gigs, you know, she lost all of it. Her, they, they all signed a letter that said, we're not going to teach any of your novels in our Native American literature classes unless you like you make an apology and you do, it was the whole thing for someone writing a character, writing about a system of spirituality that was very similar to hers. So these things happen and you cannot back down. You have to be able to write and it's only going to get worse. And please, you know, you always will have my support. If you ever are out there and you're a published author and people are, and people are coming after you, I, this channel will be a much bigger thing 10 years down the line when that's probably happening to you and email me and I will defend you. I will come on the, here and promote your book and say like, this is insane. So Mirakami actually says, we're going to move into another section. I missed this part right here. That Mirakami says that the most important part of his writing is that writing is like playing an instrument, that there are rhythm, chords, and tones, and that you need to have that synergy and that pizzazz about your writing. And I think that's a very, very good. I think that's a very good analysis from Mirakami that a lot of the greatest writers and really good writing, writing that is rewritten and revised has a nice flow to it, has good language, and rhythm to it. So that's something to focus on that Mirakami thinks is important. And that's very obvious, but a lot of people don't accomplish that. So now we're going to talk about how Mirakami actually writes his novels, like the actual process. So the first thing he says is that you need to clear your desk, that you can only focus on one thing at a time. If you're going to write a novel, you can have nothing else going on, that you can do nothing else. In short stories, essays, nonfiction, that's all just practice for a novel. And when you are going to write a novel, you need to stop all of that until you are completely done. Done, done. Not on the breaks that we're going to talk about. You get a couple breaks in throughout the writing of a novel, nothing. You take a break from writing completely. But he does believe that you can translate when you're not in the mood. If you want to translate something into, you know, your language from another language, he says that's a, the logical part of the brain and it's not the same. So Mirakami actually talked about, and I didn't know this, about how much he wrote abroad in Kauai, on the North Shore um, of Kauai. Um, and I love that, you know, it's so expensive. I'd love to live up there and write up there. He wrote in France. He wrote in a couple other places, uh, some full novels. He wrote Kafka on, on the shore completely in Hawaii. So his program is writing 1600 words per day. He writes 1,600 words per day. Stephen King writes 2,000 words per day. Ray Bradbury writes, writes, writes the same similar amount. That's what a lot of novelists seem to do, that 15 to 2,500 words a day is a good amount. We could call it 1,000 to 2,000 even, is a good amount to write, especially for a first draft. So you're going to write that out. So let's say you have 1,600 words per day, your 100,000 word novel, that will take you approximately, we'll just call it three months, 90 days, a little bit more, you'll have a little bit more than that. But so once you are done with that novel and there's no plotting, you then, you then take a one week break. And then you spend a month or two rewriting that novel. You do a full rewrite. You just go through it. And obviously you guys know how to revise. It doesn't actually offer too much advice on revising, just a general revision. Then you take a two to four week break and then you do another draft. So we've done the second draft. Now you do a third draft of the novel. Then after the third rewrite, you give it to a couple trusted peers, just a couple, maybe just one. And then you start rewriting the scenes and sections that they have a problem with. So then you give it to them and they tell you all their problems and you rewrite everything and try to fix whatever you can, maybe listen into their ideas, maybe don't. But you do peer revision, peer revision, and then you finally do a final rewrite. You do one final rewrite to type, to tighten everything up. And that's Mirakami's plan. So basically around, we could call it five drafts. He does about five drafts for a novel, but he says he can do more if it really needs it. It can be up, you know, probably sounded like up to 10 novels if he needs it. So now we're going to talk about, so that's, that's the plan, but that's hard to execute because writing is extremely lonely. No one can help you get through this process, you know, with all the distractions and hard parts about writing, you know, no one can help you do this. It's going to be very hard to be able to get these words down and make novels happen. And all that you need though is stamina, mental and physical stamina, as Mirakami says, because you need to write seven days per week until that book is done, revised, and then you can take a break. Then you can take a year off or whatever. But to be a novelist, you need to write every single day or revise every single day until that damn book is done. And, you know, three days a week, he says, is not going to cut it. Three, you know, there it is. He says th three days a week, you are not going to be make novelists, being a novelist a vocation. It, this is something something that you do every day, even if it's just for an hour or two. It is a practice. It is a skill. It is like, you know, an Olympic gymnast doesn't train every day. They actually train a lot, but you know, they stretch on their off days. They do things. They still eat well. They still have a mindset. You know, you still are practicing every single day if you're trying to become elite or do something. And so he actually says it. He says that fat people can't write, that as you start to get fat, that you start to lose the endurance and you start slowing down, not just as, you know, a human being, but as a writer, as a person. And I was laughing because like, if you look at um, Mirakami, Stephen King, Don DeLille, DeLille, they've written a ton of books, man. They have a decent pace. And then you look, they're all skinny. They all exercise. Um, I think DeLillo's, um, DeLillo Mirakami run, and I think Stephen King might do cardio too. He at least takes big walks. And 
George R. R. Martin, though, not the healthiest of guys. How long is it taking him to write these novels now that he's gotten older? Seems like he's moving when you talk. He kind of has this, you know, he has this slow pace to him. And that makes sense that this is, he says that physical fitness is the most important thing you can do as a novelist outside of actually writing. And I would agree that like physical exercise, if you were trying to do this for decades and feel good, then you need to physically exercise just to get yourself away, to do, to work the brain in a different way. And I think it, you know, I think it does a lot for you. So, and this is hard, you know, because if we're talking about mental toughness, a lot of us have jobs. A lot of us are working these jobs. So then we have to come home and write. We have to exercise. We might have families. We might have other responsibilities, hobbies, aspiration, dream, aspirations, dreams. But if you want to do this, you have to do this. You have to find the time. You're going to have to cut out something. You might need to sleep a little bit faster every night. Uh, Octavia Butler and Tony Morrison woke up at 4 a.m. every day and b before their kids woke up and before they had to go work a day job. And that's when they got their writing done. How bad do you want this? There's nothing glamorous about about this lifestyle. We need what we need in this world more so than anything is sober writers who work hard. People think that they need to live a chaotic lifestyle and have all this stuff to be this artist. You know, they need drugs or whatever or tumultuous. I know so many writers who have like tumultuous relationships, man. There's always something going on. There's always a new girl or guy and they can't seem to stay with anyone for very long. They always have you know, some vice, you know, especially like with a drug, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, weed, you know, whatever, Adderall, they're on antidepressants. There's always something going on. And they are the most unproductive people I know. The most sober people I know um, are the most hard worker, hardworking novelists. And most of the time they maybe drink a little bit of whiskey or, you know, a little bit of beer after, at the end of the day, you know, and they are into that micro beers or like nice whiskey. That seems to be a trend that I've noticed with my most successful peers in the novel writing world. Because the chaos that we need is in our unconscious. The most chaotic times in my life have been my most least productive as a writer. And when I'm trying to write in that time, if I can force myself to be productive, my writing, all that energy is getting placed elsewhere. You know, that's what it's really about. Writing, becoming novelist is about trying to store and create energy and using that to flow into the novel. Cause you have to sit down, stand up and think really hard and be in these fixed positions. That's very hard. So you have to gather that energy so that you can do it. This is a lifestyle commitment, everybody. That's what Mirakami is saying. And it's hard, Mirakami says, because we need to recover. We've had a lot of trauma. We talked about this earlier, but the school system, for instance, and Mirakami believes is that we need individual recovery zones as high schoolers and as human beings. He believes like the government should provide these so that we can recover from a lot of the stuff that's happened to us so that we can actually slow down. And he says that reading is a great recovery zone, that just sitting and reading is a great place to, and great way to slow down and recover from a lot of the trauma that's happened to us. And I wholeheartedly agree with this, that like as a high school teacher now, I, it doesn't happen as me to me as much, but I watch my students shame other students for their artistic desires, man. It's hard. Society is hard. Working a job and having a family and trying to make it and having the self-esteem to do this and struggle through poverty and figure out what you're going to do. It is not easy, everybody. You know how hard it is. You're doing it with me right now because a novelist needs to get rid of all that excess baggage because a novelist is someone who creates their own world. That's a, they, you know, at some level, sh level should be apolitical. They should not be engaging in the, you know, lifestyle of your famous author, you know, going out and partying and speaking, Mirakami, McCarthy, Don the Little, Tom Bitt's Pynchon, all the greats. They do not do this. You do not, do not see them on a local book tour because you start to experience burnout. You know, there's a burnout factor that happens. Look at, you know, for instance, you know, I'm so, so on Jordan Pearson, you know, I like some of his stuff, don't like some of his other stuff. But he got hooked on benzodiazepine, you know, because I think he says it was because of his wife and all that. But there's a lot of stress when you become an overnight celebrity. We see it all the time. And Jordan Peterson is going out all the time on tour and doing all this stuff. And like when he looks back and we look back at his career, I'm sure his fans out there, you know, want more stuff. They don't need to see him. They would to, if you want to be productive, you know, you have to sit down and write and think. And Jordan Peterson, someone who observes this stuff and is observed, you know, because I'm into psychoanalytical thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a union. And I'm really into Freud. You know, he has basically made very little progress with a lot of his work over the last five years. You know, he's done some stuff on the Bible and stuff, but basically, you know, if you look at his, he's just speaking about all the same stuff that his whole career was was oriented about. And then that's why he's added in added in like politics and other stuff because that's just really easy to talk about. You know, politics. All you have to do to get into politics is just read the news and have an opinion. So you know, for someone like Jordan Peterson, who I think you know he's obviously smart, it would be better for him to slow it down and you know remove a lot of that excess and recover and you know focus on the work but obviously everyone has a different path out there everyone has different desires and wants to do what they want to do and live the way they want to live and i understand that.
understand that. And Mirakami does too in this novel, in, in this book. It says that multiple times. So he also state say so he also stated something that was very interesting. That first person is very limiting. He called first person limiting. That the for all his first couple novels, you know, up until the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, were all in first person. I didn't realize that. And then in Kafka on the Shore, he split it. Half of Kafka on the Shore was in the first person, and then the other chapters were in third person. And then in After Dark, and then I can't remember a, a short story collection. He made everything third person. Um, and you know, After Dark was very short, and obviously short stories. And he had to make that transition over the course of, if we look at the timeline, let me look. Literally the course of ten years. Wind Up Bird came up out in 1994, so we can assume that he started doing thinking about this in like 1993. So then in 2004 to, you know, After Dark comes out. So we'll say 2003, he finishes it. That's, you know, a 10 year period where he had to focus and reinvent himself as a third person writer. And a lot of people, you know, could argue that they don't like his, you know, third person work as much. You know, a lot of people like the pre wind up Chronicles stuff better. But when I look at Kafka on the shore, IQ84, even his last novel, they are very good. I enjoyed them immensely. And he also mentioned in Wind Up Bird Chronicle, he was struggling so much with the first person. That's why he actually started to um, he added in all those letters and all those kind of weird points of views to break up the novel because he couldn't get the idea that he wanted to across with just the first person. So he had to, he had this idea and this vision of what he wanted it to be, but he didn't have the power through the, a first person male protagonist anymore to make it happen. So I find that very interesting. And when I look at the list of books, could say that, that er, these last couple books are a little bit weaker, but I, I, I would say they're about the same. So if you want to make being a novelist your vocation, you need to be serious about this. You need to commit. Mirakami sold his jazz club. He took a risk and didn't have the money, you know? He took a risk before he was a full-time author and like was making a full-time salary to become an author and lived off of savings. And if you want to do this, you're going to have to make sacrifices. And when the time comes, maybe not at the start, he was working manual labor jobs and doing other things to support himself. But when the time comes, you will see that point and you have to have the courage to do that. So everything until then, every single day, you have to prep yourself to do that because your husband, your wife, your family, your friends, your logical mind are going to tell you maybe not to do it. And you have to be prepared to do it. So thank you guys for watching this. And if you guys want to watch this video over here about if Haruki Mirakami is a misogynist, go check that out right now and peace.